from WBUR Boston and NPR. I'm Tom Ashbrook, and this is On Point. Renegade husband and wife philosophers Pat and Paul Churchland met 40 years ago in a college Plato class. Their instincts as philosophers then and now run outside the mainstream, where most philosophers looked to reason and logic to apprehend the human mind. The Churchlands looked and look to science. There is no independent mind, these two practically say, just the human brain, three pounds of tissue and water firing away behind all our emotions, beliefs, actions, consciousness itself, they say, straight biology, a machine. Once that sounded esoteric, now it's on the front line of debates over law, soul, and life. Up next on point, Pat and Paul Churchland on the mind as straight science. I should say later in this hour we'll be joined by the eminent philosopher Colin McGinn, who has strongly disagreed with the Churchland's approach. But first, joining me now from San Diego are Patricia and Paul Churchland. They're professors of philosophy at the University of California, San Diego. They've written extensively on the brain, mind. Paul Churchland is author of Neurophilosophy at Work. Patricia Churchland is author of Brainwise, Studies in Neurophilosophy. They were featured in the New Yorker magazine last month in an article titled Two Heads, A Marriage Devoted to the Mind-Body Problem. Patricia and Paul Churchland, thank you very much for being with us. Hello, Tom. Hello, Tom. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. It's great to have you both. The, the, the very idea, there was a terrific piece, we, we thought, by uh, Larissa McFarquhar in the New Yorker uh, describing you two after, after nearly 40 years together uh, as practically one great bundle of neurophilosophy. <laughs> was she kidding, Patricia, Paul, or, or, or do you see your... Your minds, your brains is practically um, mm, what con a condominium now, working together. Well, you know, it's been great fun. And it's been great fun because the issues are so tremendously exciting. And we happen to be very lucky in realizing early on that neuroscience was going to teach us an enormous amount about the nature of the mind. And so uh, as neuroscience has developed and experimental psychology has developed, we have just found the discussion and the implications for philosophy just enormously interesting. Well, uh, let me ask you, I, I uh, add, Paul, please, yes. I should add, Tom, that the uh, neuroscience community and the psychology community and the computer science community in general have been very welcoming uh, over the past 20 and 30 years, uh, both in our years in Canada and in our uh, years down here at uh, UC San Diego. Uh, it's uh, an interdisciplinary hotbed here, and it's been uh, a wonderful community to be a part of. This isn't uh, just an enterprise of a couple of renegade philosophers, as I think the blurb <laughs> said. This is an well, enterprise of three or four disciplines all working together. Positively, and, and we've seen signs of that receptivity especially on the science side, but we're also uh, from kind of a, 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 a civilian level aware of the controversy on the philosopher's side. I mean, let, let me put it to you, I, I guess, I, I think we have some understanding of what neuroscience is, the science of the brain, and we think we have some idea what philosophy is, but Patricia, Paul, what's neurophilosophy? Well, Pat uh, entitled her first book, Neurophilosophy, so by rights, uh, she should be answering this question. <laughs> right, but she, right. but okay, well. she gestured to me, so <laughs> I've started. But Pat, why don't you tell them what neurophilosophy well, is? Well, the way I thought of it, and I mean, it was really the way the two of us thought of it in the, the 70s and 80s was really very simple, that philosophers have traditionally been very interested in questions about the nature of knowledge and how we manage to learn and remember and know anything, the nature of perception, how it is that we can have some sort of understanding of what's out there in the external world, and also the nature of decision-making, consciousness, and so forth. Mm. And what we thought, and, and I think this is clearly being borne out now, is that Rather than looking only to one's sort of intuitions about these things, that the sciences both of behavior, psychology, and of the brain, neuroscience, mm. would teach us a lot about how these things actually work. Now, this wasn't something that was possible for David Hume in the 18th century because mm -hmm. the science wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But for us in the 20th century, the science began to be there, and of course, as you know, it's grown and grown to the point where the interface between these old, wonderful, traditional questions mm. and neuroscience just got richer and richer. 
Paul, t- take us into that uh, interface. I mean, the mind-body problem has been around forever. I wish you'd, for those of us who aren't philosophers and don't practice this, remind us of what the mind-body problem is in philosophy, going all the way back to the ancients. And then uh, spin us forward, if you would, to the the, the, the new what uh, insights on that front today that, that science, neuroscience, is bringing us. Well, I'll try. Um, humans have had a fairly intricate uh, and clever conception of the kinds of beings they are from... Um, <laughs> from the Greek times and indeed thousands of years before. If you read uh, the Greek poets and the Greek plays, they are using the same vocabulary and dealing with the same uh, issues about love and hate and fate and tragedy that uh, that we discuss today. Um, but they didn't know anything about the uh, internal organ that uh, now appears is sustaining all of that wonderful activity. Mm. The mind-body problem has been the problem of how to square the complex phenomena that we think of as mental phenomena with the uh, equally complex physical and electrical and chemical phenomena going on in the brain. Uh, How is the mind on the one hand related to the body on the other? And there's been a long tradition, familiar to everybody even in this century, that the the mind is a non-physical thing which somehow interacts with the brain, Mm -hmm. something that might have existed before the body came into being, something that might survive bodily death. Uh, This is standard substance dualism. Uh, Mm -hmm. The Mm -hmm. expression comes from Descartes' philosophy uh, primarily, since Mm -hmm. he's its modern exponent. And uh, those sorts of views, uh, uh, accounts of the relation, were... um, contrasted with those who said, no, no, there's a much closer relation. Uh, The mind really is just the brain, or a a mind is a properly functioning brain, and everything that goes on in the mind, all of our hopes and fears and dreams and itches and tickles and so forth, Mm -hmm. are really nothing more than activities in the nervous system. This wasn't a very popular view until, well, it began to become quite popular after Charles Darwin, when uh, he gave us a story which seemed to unite us with all of the other creatures on the planet, and uh, uh, people were perfectly willing to see their behavior as being governed by the activity of a nervous system. Uh, Humans just got swept up in the the biological story um, as time rolled by. There are other subtleties, but that's the first great division between dualistic theories of mind and those that attempt to um, identify mental phenomena with phenomena going on in the brain. And you're, you're taking that science uh, piece and writing it way out uh, in, into philosophy. Patricia, uh, I imagine that when you sit with students at the college level, many of them, despite the sort of evolution in our human thinking about all this and our greater understanding of biology, they probably still bring that sense of a, of a mind independent of biology at some level into the classroom. How do you explain this much more immediately brain-oriented view of philosophy that you've got to, to, to newcomers to your realm? Well, that's a good question because I think there is a kind of intuitive feeling, um, and it's part of what the brain does for us, uh, that uh, one's mental life is not the same as or could not be described in terms of the physical brain. But the way I, I approach it with students is really recapitulates the way I learned about it myself. And so let me give you one example. Uh, One of the most extraordinary experiences I had in viewing a neurological patient was a patient of the Damasios in Iowa City. And this was a man who had suffered uh, as a result of a virus the destruction of the hippocampal structures on both sides of his brain. Now, the hippocampus is a little bit of very old cortex, sort of tucked way into the middle of the brain. Okay. And the extraordinary thing about uh, RB was that you could meet him, and for the first few minutes, he seemed very normal. He, he was very social. He, had, uh, he uh, would greet you in a very charming way. But then it became quickly apparent that he was incapable of learning anything new. 